Numbers speak. The voice of the people is heard via the numbers. Yes, you put the word out for action. You make a call for results. And yes, indeed, if you're talking about this program right here, you know you can rely on the people to deliver. And what is this? What's going on? Who are the people? What am I talking about? Why am I waving this thing in front of the camera and being a disembodied voice? Because this, as you might have guessed, is this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. And if you're watching right now live on the dreaded Facebook, you will know what happened earlier today when I put the call out for some numbers. Yes, for some numbers. I woke up this morning and I was bewildered. I was completely, utterly flummoxed. I was drawing a blank. Nothing made sense. I was opening my eyes and I thought, what am I going to talk about tonight on Tent Talks Tunes? I don't know. I was just really, I had no ideas. So I've done what, what I did was what I have done in the past and put the word out to you the educated consumer of cable TV style talk programming and asked for numbers. I said, okay, gang, in so many words, I have 25 bins of 12 inch LP records in my personal collection. And you guys post a number and the number that gets the most votes wins. I will go to the corresponding bin of albums and talk about the contents of that bin. Because every single bin's got something interesting in it. I'll drink to that. It's my record collection. Hey! So, what you saw when I, when I was waving around in front of the camera is the actual tally results. Every single number that got a vote, I counted them up. And here, proving that democracy does work and is a real thing, at least on Tent Talks Tunes, I'm going to read the votes to you, and we're going to talk about the winning bin, which I loaded up into a crate and schlepped over here to Tent Talk Tunes Studios. Actually, you can see it right there. Right here, we're going to talk about it. But in my time-honored fashion here on Tank Talks Tunes. We're going to check the mailbox, and we're going to check the bulletin board briefly to see what's going on in this so-called real world. And uh, then we'll get right down to the grist of the mill, this crate full of records from the mysteriously numbered bin. Well, let's see. Before I can get to the mail, I see that it's buried under a couple of items. I always have to talk about my label, TPOS, and all the exciting doings, comings, and goings that I've got going on. I've got some new releases happening, and I'm sure that Payer out in Sweden wants to hear about it. Ray in Tucson wants to hear about it. Alan wants to hear about it. James in Connecticut wants to hear about it. All of you people want to hear about what I've been up to with TPOS. I'll make it brief. I have a side project, a noise project, called Fried Man. And a long time ago, I was experimenting with lathe cut records. And you guys have heard me talk about lathe cut records a few times on this show. Um, my main man, uh, Tyler Bisson, down at Audio Geography Studios, was just starting out as a lathe cutter. And he was experimenting with different substances and uh, materials to cut records on. And at one point, the idea came up that you could conceivably cut a record on a disposable plastic dinner plate. You know, because with a lathe cutter, you can you can etch a groove onto pretty much any substance that will hold the groove. You know, that's just malleable enough to be cut, but solid enough to stay intact. And so we were talking about disposable plastic dinner plates, and I sent him a very, I sent him a, like about a one minute long noise clip, and I had him cut 25 disposable paper, uh, disposable plastic plates with this noise loop. And then for years and years and years, I couldn't figure out exactly what I wanted to do with it. And then, you know, the usual story, I was uh, sound asleep, and I woke up and said, yes, 
I'm going to make it elliptical. I'm going to make this noise groove that's cut onto a disposable plastic plate an elliptical record. And how do you do that? You take the record that was cut with concentric grooves and you cut a triangular hole in the middle to play it with. So really, there's no way to actually play it like a regular record. One way or another, unless you've got microscopic precision, it's going to play somewhat elliptically. And because of that, the noise groove on the record is never going to play the same way twice. So every time you play one of these things, it's going to be a unique listening experience. And it's on a flexible piece of plastic. So that's pretty cool. I finally know what to do with these things now. And I have literally had these things cut like seven or eight years ago, maybe even longer. The patience pays off. So I've got a brand new release, Fried Man Elliptical Music on, I don't know if it's vinyl, but whatever it is, it plays on your record player. So I'm going to be making cover art for this pretty soon and getting them on my Discogs page so all of you noise mongers out there can have a crack at it. You can even eat dinner off it if you want, provided you got something that does not fall in between the parameters of the non-round hole. Now, let's see. What else I've been working on? Well, I've been talking a lot about the upcoming... Mad Brother Ward and G.G. Allen releases on TPOS. I've shown the CDs of them, but I need to mention that we got cassettes, too. These are the cassette inserts that I got back from the printer. And I've been going nuts folding and assembling cassettes. The first run of each, you'll notice, is numbered. Numbered uh, technically by hand, but hand via rubber stamp, actually. Each one numbered. And in the case of the Mad Brother Ward cassette, I don't know if you can actually see this, but he signed every single one of them. That is a handwritten signature from Mad Brother Ward himself. Limited to a hundred-ish of each. And I'm going to do an actual full-blown release date of both titles on the same day, I'm pretty sure. We're going to go for January 22nd on that. So keep your eye on my page, on the G.G. Allen fan page, and on the Destructo Central anti-scene fan page for the official launch of the cassette and CD limited first-run editions of Mad Brother Ward and the G.G. Allen Suicide Rehearsals. You heard it here first. Now, we could go to the mailbox, but we'll do that in a minute. We're kind of on a sort of bulletin board thing. What's, what do we got on the bulletin board? Well, I'm excited because uh, this coming Sunday, January 15th, in Danbury, at the Sugar Hollow Tap Room, we're having a benefit show for our friend Brett Buzzard Mikowski. Brett was an original member of Pro Phonautica. Black Metal Legends, America's first ever black metal band, and they're from this area. He's been having some health problems, so we're having a great big old benefit show in the time honor tradition of benefit shows. Sacred Oath, Widows, Carried by Six, the Black Richards, and a host of others are playing, and I will be set up with a table or two full of quality new and used records, tapes, CDs, and gosh knows what else. I will be selling like mad. And I will be donating a cut of my proceeds to the Buzzard Medical Benefit Fund. So by all means, if you're anywhere near Danbury, come on out to the Sugar Hollow Tap Room, see some excellent bands, and buy some excellent music from me, and help an excellent fellow who could use a helping hand. A toast to Brett and helping out our fellow musicians. Jenny DeSoto is tuned in from New Jersey. Hello, Jenny. Jenny and I have the same birthday, September 23rd. Same birthday as Ray Charles, John Coltrane, Bruce Springsteen, whatever. Still a pretty classy day, that's September 23rd. Y'all might want to mark that on your calendars. Speaking of calendars, <clears throat> we'll just take a very, very quick look. Uh, Jeff Clayton, my boss in anti-scene, yesterday did a soft reveal on some upcoming anti-scene concert activity. 
So I'm just going to follow up on what he was talking about. Um, February 12th, we have a private invite only recording session for an album that we are going to release exclusively at the Anti-Scene 30th Anniversary Show, which is going to be in Spartanburg, South Carolina on September 30th of this year, a week after my birthday. That's going to be cool. But you got to get an invite from one of us in order to attend. Just letting you know. Then looking forward to March, what we have penciled in, and if you look at my calendar, you'll see that it is indeed written in pencil because we know how these things go. But penciled in, we've got Anti-Scene playing in Shreveport, Louisiana, Mobile, Alabama, and New Orleans, Louisiana. And then on March 19th, we have a Malcolm Tent solo gig in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And then looking forward to April, we tentatively, once again, have penciled in anti-scene shows for Atlanta, Charlotte, and a city in Tennessee to be determined. So we'll keep you posted on that. And of course, we just uh, confirmed today that May 6th, May 6th is the next Danbury Record and CD Expo. Connecticut's longest running record show, co-promoted by me. And uh, you just imagine a room full of record dealers selling a lot of awesome, really cool stuff. So May 6th, put that on your calendar and smoke it. A toast to the Danbury Record and CD Expo. It's Danbury Tap, so it might as well be Danbury. Uh, oh boy, I'm advertising somebody's brand of water. Sorry, guys. My normal rule is I don't advertise anything but me and people who I really like and think whose endeavors are worth it. So we're going to fix that right now so I can host, hoist a jug full of Danbury Tap and you know it ain't nothing but Danbury Tap. All right, let's check the mailbox. We got a couple of items here. Um, one with a return address that I do recognize and one with a return address I don't recognize. The first one I don't recognize is from Death Genesis of Royal Oak, Michigan. And the people, person, things, whoever, whatever at Death Genesis did indeed take the time to put pen in hand and put pen to envelope and send me this TPOS, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. Not only that, they sent it first class. How cool is that? They know that I live to get mail in my mailbox. So let's see what Death Genesis sent us. This is a cold reveal. There is no clue as to what is actually in here. You can see it's got the seal on it. So I'm going to grab me the Million Mile Scissors, which are actually way over here. Pardon my forehead. Pardon my reach. Million Mile Scissors. We're going to put another couple inches on them right now by opening this envelope cold. Boy, I hope there's not any, like, rubber snakes or... Uh, triggered stink bombs or something like that in here. Let's take a quick look here, make sure... I can, I can kind of feel what's in there, but I can't totally feel what's in there. Ah, let's see. I detect some physical media, and I just dropped one of them on the floor. We have a CD uh, by, apparently, a group called Death Genesis. Or is it PB? I don't know, but it's got a, an OB on it. Having an OB is always a good sign. It's got a song in there called Satan's Oscilloscope, which is already very promising. I love absurd song titles. It says it was recorded in the winter of 2021 with analog digital modular system Moog Workstot, or Moog Workstot, I should say, a P32 drum machine, and a micro granny sampler. All sounds by PB. I'm intrigued. I will be listening to this when I drive down to North Carolina, because that's when I've got the most time to sit down and listen to CDs. And here's another Death Genesis and a handwritten letter, the types of which I love. You've seen it come out in the envelope, so I don't know what it says, but it looks promising. And a cassette, very carefully wrapped. Thank you, Death Genesis. And it is indeed a King Shoji cassette. Black Rainbow Machine is the name of it. 
physical media, kids. Really cool. I just love this kind of stuff. Thank you, Death Genesis. I promise I will listen to every single scrap of noise and or music you just sent me. And I will also endeavor mightily to send you something in return from my label that I think matches whatever you sent me. I don't know what it is, but I'll bet you I got something. I'll bet I got something. So cheers to that. Love me some good old-fashioned mail trades. All right, next up in the mailbox, we got a uh, box. This is from La Doma Dorada y El Marido Sin Nombre. Now tell me, that's not a classy-looking box. That's a work of art in itself. <clears throat> With very specific instructions, Tent Talks Tunes, on air, open only. When La Dama Dorada speaks, I listen. So as you can see, the box is still sealed. Sealed on all ends. And according to instructions, this is going to be an on air, open only. A cold reveal, if you will. Boy, those people out in Arizona, I just love this kind of stuff. All right, so here we go. Million Mile Scissors, which double as a box opener. We are, of course, opening carefully. When I opened up a, a box of hand-lathed records not too long ago, I was using my box cutter, and I, for some reason, I don't know, I thought it was maybe packed a little bit differently, but it wasn't, it didn't have a layer of protection, so I took that box cutter and went and sliced a giant chunk out of the top record on the box. I was not happy about that. I sent an angry letter of complaint to the label. But really, whose fault is it, you know? So here we go. We're opening it up. It's fragile. Scissors closed for safety. What's in the box? What's in the box? What could possibly be in the box? Oh, we got all kinds of stuff here. Okay, we got the box. We got the packaging material. Oh, boy. <laughs> Somebody knows me well out in Arizona. Oh my gosh, a Roonies. Okay, this is very cool stuff. Very cool stuff. Okay, where to even begin? Well, since this is a Connecticut-based show, and I, I will reveal that La Dama Dorada y Su Esposa are from Connecticut originally, it's kind of only appropriate that they would send me a Mankind Discography LP, and I didn't know this was out. I had no idea this was out. Mankind or Connecticut political hardcore heavyweights from the 90s. This is this is real good stuff. And I've never seen this before. This is really cool. LP. It's like a big old booklet enclosed with it and some other goodies and stuff. Very exciting. Thank you for that. I will totally be digging into this later. Um, probably wait till I'm really pissed off about something. This is real good music to be pissed off by. <laughs> and not only that, I don't know who Gutter Town is, but there's their sticker. Now here's an envelope. These envelopes have been making the rounds in my circles. I already know what's in it, but I'm going to show everybody so you can see. One of my opinions, one of my many opinions, one of my many, many, many opinions, besides the very demonstrative and emotional clown, relates to art. 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 <laughs> Just saying, kids. As my good friend Rich Mackin used to say, less artsy, more fartsy. And this sticker kind of encapsulates all of that. And then, boy, this, this is what made my eyes light up when I saw them. Check this out. Vintage Circus Magazine with Peter Chris on the cover. I don't even have this one. I've never seen this one before. Old Peter Chris, Boy, he got his moment of ego gratification when they put him on the cover instead of Gene Simmons for once. What date is this? April 13th, 1978. The height of Kiss Mania. Featuring other stories about uh, George Benson, Sweet, 
Rufus, Ian Gillen, Montrose, Bob Weir, Barry Manilow, UFO, Shields and Yarnell, Shields and Yarnell, Waylon and Willie, and the Hot Wax movie. I mean, that is a damn good smorgasbord of late 70s culture right there. I love that. And a color poster of Angel. Dang, that's cool. And of course, this also makes me happy. We've talked about Cream Magazine an awful lot. And by gosh, this one dated January 1980. I actually had this one. I bought this one at the, uh, the local drugstore because they carried Cream every month. I went down there every month looking for the latest various Marvel comics and the latest issues of Cream Magazine. And they had this one and I bought it. And look at that. There it is on my doorstep, in my hand, and on Tent Talks Tunes. I got some good reading tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Dama Dorada y su esposa. And thank you for remembering my mailing address. TPOS PO Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. Now, I know I sent you guys something last week. But now I got to get the wheels turning to think of something else to send you. We just keep the, the exchange of information and art going. Neil, Ag Neil Agneta says, get your head out of your art. Sound advice. Sound advice, Neil. Very sound advice. All right, kids. We've gotten, every, we've gotten up to date on things. We know what's happening in the real world. We've checked the bulletin board. We've checked the mailbox. We've checked the calendar. What do you say we get together and talk tunes? So this is it. This is the real honest-to-gosh results of the poll. 25 numbers. We got votes ranging from zero to half a dozen each. And it's interesting. Nobody voted for one. The number one got zero. Numbers 8, 11, 12, 15... 21 and 22 all got zero. Why is that? A few others only got one, like three and four, 10, 16, 18, 25 got one vote. And then the others got various numbers. The, the most of any number getting the most votes was six. Six votes each. And here's where I had to make an executive decision. Two numbers each got six votes. Number seven and number 17. So what is a vlogger to do when it comes to breaking a tie? Well, I decided in making my decision to have mercy on all you people. Mercy, 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 mercy. Because as I count the bins of records in my personal collection, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, number seven, wouldn't you know, is one of the bins containing my Devo records. Doesn't contain all of my Devo records, about half of them. And I figure, you know, I talk an awful lot about Devo on this program, and I'm pretty sure I've already done one entire episode of Tent Talks Tunes about the contents of bin number seven, which is all Devo records. So I figure, you know what, we can actually butter our bread on both sides. If you guys want to hear about the contents of bin number seven, simply go to my YouTube channel, look up Tent Talks Tunes, and, you know, type in like Tent Talks Tunes Devo, and no doubt that episode will come up. So if you voted for number seven, you can win by going back in time and watching that archived episode. If you voted for number 17... You get to win right here, right now. Because number 17, it's got a whole bunch of stuff in it, including a lot of stuff I never talked about. Um, you know, one band I have talked about a lot, but not all of these records. Bin number 17 is the one that goes from R-O to S-E. Because I keep all of my records alphabetized. And how do I keep track of them? Well... I've got bin cards. There's one bin card for the start of the RO section. And then in the middle, I've got a bin card for the start of the SA section. And I know that the Saccharin Trust bin card has appeared before on Tent Talks Tunes when I did my 
good, bad, and ugly episode about SST. The SST episode is also archived on my YouTube channel. So, bin number 17, R-O, and it ends in S-E. And since you have just seen that it's got a Rolling Stones place card, you can probably guess that the Stones are the first group I'm going to talk about. And this is kind of germane because I recently scored something that made me really happy. I might have mentioned this one in passing, but I don't think I talked about it in detail. Let's see. Let me flip through these records here. This is live, by the way, kids. And if you're watching this on my YouTube channel, this was live. A key component of my musical upbringing was the bootleg LP, which I discovered sometime around the year 1978. And as mentioned before, I did an entire episode of Ten Talks Tunes on my discovery of the vintage vinyl bootleg LP. And the first one I ever bought anywhere at a head shop in North Miami Beach was this one right here. The Rolling Stones in concert. And this album has a very long, twisted story as far as my record collection goes. I was just thinking about it the other day. I, I have, technically, the exact same record collection that I've always had. My record collection has been with me since I got my first record at the age of seven. It's technically the same collection. I have never once ever dumped all of my records and then started anew. It's always been the same. It started with that one copy of Grand Funk Live album and more and more were added to it. And then, you know, records were subtracted as they got worn out or destroyed or lost or whatever, and then replaced with others. And so the collection has just gradually morphed since I was seven years old, maybe even six, I forget. <clears throat> so it's technically the same collection. And this is, and this, this is a really good example of how the collection morphs. The cover that I'm showing you right now is the original album cover of the record that I bought at that head shop in North Miami Beach in 1978. But over the years, <clears throat> you know, I, you know, one, one has different ways of thinking at different times in one's life. And so I went through this period where I was less concerned with the integrity of the actual item itself and more interested in upgrading the audio quality. Because you might remember, if you saw that episode of Tent Talk Tunes about vintage bootleg LPs, when I bought this record and got it home, I was somewhat taken aback by how god-awful lousy it sounded. It was like... It didn't sound like a regular album that I would go buy at Specs Music or Peaches or Vibrations or what have you. It was pretty rotten sounding. <laughs> Wasn't enough to kill my enthusiasm for the medium, but it was pretty bad sounding. So when I had my record store, as time went on, every whenever one of these records or a version thereof would pop up, and there was always a version thereof, for years and years and years I never saw this exact one. But just to backtrack a little bit, this album is this album is a knockoff repress of the world's first ever live bootleg LP, which is the Rolling Stones' "Liver Than You'll Ever Be," and it's it's been booted and rebooted and pressed and repressed about 285 million times. So whenever I would get any version of this album that sounded better than my original version, I would simply swap the records out. So I took the original vinyl from this one and swapped it out, I think maybe only once, maybe more than once, but definitely at least once, and, you know, got a slight sonic upgrade, which I stuck in the original cover. So, okay. It's the same cover that I've had since 1978, but a different record. Are you guys following me? Does this make any sense at all? It does to me. 
So, you know, having done that, of course, a couple years later, I ended up regretting it because, you know, I wanted the original record that I bought way back then. So I always kept my eyes open for more copies of this Rolling Stones in concert that came out on the so-called Berkeley record label. Now, a few years ago, I was really sitting pretty. This really, really blew my effing mind. I mean, you want to talk about blowing my effing mind? This blew my effing mind when um, my friend Dino, who curates the vinyl selection at the um, the Archive record store, video store in Bridgeport, Connecticut, Dino came across a huge, huge, huge collection of records, including a lot of sealed vintage vinyl from the 60s and 70s and a lot of boots and you know you guys saw how i reacted when i saw the package from la dama dorada with those great magazines and that mankind record i i probably did a, a an honest to god spit take when i saw this okay not only a copy of rolling stones in concert not only sealed as you can see but stand on my skull and call me shorty it's got a sticker a price tag from discount records of north miami beach florida the same place where i bought mine in 1978 it is absolutely conceivable that this record was in the bin at the exact same time when i bought mine or maybe this one was taken out of the storeroom and and replaced the one that I bought. Uh, you know, it, it, incredible, just incredible. And how this ended up in the hands of a fellow record dealer in Connecticut, I'll never know. It's, it's a mystery. And then it ended up in my hands. So talk about incredible, amazing coincidences. Made me very happy. This is literally a piece of my musical history and growing up as a record collector same album same record store same time still sealed i ain't opening this one and uh, kevin era wants to know what year the rolling stones concert was this is actually the infamous show from oakland california november 9th i think november 9th 1969 oakland california november 9th 1969 Right at the very beginning of the uh, Beggar's Banquet, Let It Be, Let It Bleed tour, as documented officially on Get Your Yaya's Out. And Get Your Yaya's Out was released to counteract the extreme popularity of Liver Than You'll Ever Be. A case, if there ever was, of demand driving the product. So cool. So... What do you know? I've still got the original album cover. I got a sealed version of it from the very, very record shop that I bought mine at. By the way, Kevin Arrow, you're from South Florida. Did you, did you ever go to Discount Records in North Miami Beach? Did you ever venture down to Dade and go to Discount Records? Is there anybody from Florida out there who knows anything about Discount Records? Um, they, they sort of came and went... I went there as much as I possibly could, but I seem to remember that one day they just weren't there anymore. I don't really know what happened, but uh, life-changing store. So anyway, the years roll by, the years roll by. Kevin Arrow, yes, it was on 163rd Street, directly across from the 163rd Street Shopping Center before they put the dome over it when the 163rd Street Shopping Center was still outdoors. It had like an outdoor playground and an arcade and, you know, the, the anchor store was Woolworths. You know, it was really cool. That, that was a magic place as far as I was concerned. I may yet have to do a tent talks tunes about my days at the mall rat, whether it was 163rd Street Shopping Center or the Westland Mall or occasionally Dadeland or... Um, Oh, gosh, those, those are the main ones I ever went to. But I used to love Westland Mall, and I loved 163rd Street. Loved them. So, um, Kevin Arrow says, no, it, uh, Kevin Arrow says he thinks it morphed into a Peaches. That wasn't it. 
Um, this was this was further down the road. Peaches was on 167th Street. It was directly across from Open Books and Records. Discount Records was down the road across from the shopping center. So, yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, years go by, years go by, years go by. And I'm at another record store in Connecticut, a new one called Static Era Records, run by my pal Jay Reason. And Jay is doing a good job down there. And um, he had just gotten in a big old collection. Let's see, John Coletti's got something to say here. Ah, his favorite Stones boot is the Sonic Barbecue. Is that the one from Brussels 73? I see you've got a handy link there. But um, if it's Brussels 73, that might be the single best live concert by the Stones ever committed to vinyl. Just might be Brussels 73, Perth 73, Melbourne 73. They were, they were hitting a red hot streak in 73. Everybody goes on about the uh, 1972 U.S. tour of the Americas, which was a damn good tour. But I think Europe 73 beats it. They were ferocious in 73. And there's a lot of real good recordings from that leg of the tour. And I'm sure you can go on YouTube or whatever. A couple of them have been released officially now. Track them down. If you like the Stones and you just like incredible early 70s rock and roll, some of those live shows from 73 are barn burners. Mm, mm, mm. So, there I am at Static Era Records in Fairfield. Leafing through the bins, and what? What do you know? There's another one. There's another one in the bin. And I said, "Ooh, I wonder if this is the exact disc pressing that I sacrificed so many years ago for the sake of sound quality." Opens it up. Hold on, I grabbed the wrong one. This is live TV at its best, kids. L I V E. I don't know what's going to happen from minute, one minute to the next. Neither do you. Found another one. There it is. That's the one I found. Does it have the original disc? Well, bless my soul, it does. The incredibly ugly, nondescript, original Berkeley Records label. And I was down there selling a bunch of my TPOS label stuff wholesale. So even if you don't want to go to Discogs or Bandcamp to look for my face for my uh, TPOS products, you can go to one of any number of fine record stores in Connecticut, such as Red Scroll or the Archive or Static Era, and get TPOS stuff in person. So yeah, I traded a bunch of TPOS stuff for this original label. Original cover of the very first bootleg LP I ever bought in 1978. And that would answer the question if anybody, you know, was just idly browsing through my collection and wanted to know why exactly it is that I have not one, not two, but three copies the same darn album plus a variant that's why that's the very long story of why i have these and then um the punchline after all that was that when i got that copy home with the original berkeley label the first thing of course i did was to put it on because i remembered how just ghastly it sounded when i first bought it you know but i still kept going back for more i, I had to remember just how bad it sounded. It didn't actually sound that bad, you know? It sounded a heck of a lot better to my ears now than it did back then. And I think it's because I spent the last 45 years listening to uh, various bootleg recordings of far worse quality, you know? Um, you know, if you're, you, some of you guys might relate to this. If you're a fan of a band, if you're totally fanatical about a band, your ears will put up with a lot of sonic deficiencies just so you can hear a certain recording. So yeah, it turns out that it's actually not that bad. It's, it's fairly comparable to an original Got Liver. Maybe a little bit thinner, maybe a little bit more tinny, 
but basically the same. So, go figure. That's just one of the records that you can find in bin number 17 of my personal collection. Bin number 17 chosen by you, the people, for me to talk about on tonight's Tent Talks Tunes. I've still got a few minutes left, so let's see if we can get past the Rolling Stones section, shall we? I'm going to skip all the other ones, except for the except for two I'm going to mention briefly, very briefly. The fact that I love variants, I love variations, and one of my favorites is the, um, the UK pressing of Sticky Fingers, which has uh, different rubber stamp art from the American pressing, and a different zipper. Completely different zipper design from the US pressing, and a different rubber stamp design. I just like that kind of stuff. I'm a collector. A collector. And another one... Do you want to talk about how the record collection has never, you know, changed from one to another, but has constantly been morphing? If you go further in my chronologically arranged Stones albums, you will find the one and only original copy of Some Girls that I bought when it first came out in the summer of 1978. This is the one I've had ever since the day it came out. And you probably can't see this, but if you look very carefully on the uh, end of side two, I'm sure this is not going to show up, but if you look carefully and yeah, you can, you can see it if you know what you're looking for. There's actually groove damage on Shattered toward the middle of the song Shattered because uh, at the time I had this very cheap Radio Shack record player. And it wasn't even close to being set up properly, so it totally gouged all the grooves toward the middle and end of Shattered. That's how I know this is still my original pressing from way back when. This record has been with me for 45 years. I do not intend to ever part with it. 100% original. I bought this at uh, the Treasury Department store in Hialeah, Florida. And... Um, Actually, uh, if you want to know the story of how I bought this, in 1978, I was, whatever, in eighth grade, couldn't drive. So me and my youngest brother, during uh, summer break, you know, when school was out for the summer, he and I would occasionally get on his, uh, his one-speed bike. <laughs> the two of us would get on his one-speed bike, and we would ride our bicycle our bicycle to the Westland Mall, which I don't know how far away it was from our house. It was a real, it was a long ass bike ride, long bike ride with the two of us on one bike. And I'd go to the record stores and he would go to the toy stores. And I remember the day that I bought Rolling Stones, some girls, because the treasury department store was across the street from the Westland Mall, I bought this, and he bought this giant-sized Shogun Warrior. If y'all don't know what a Shogun Warrior is, look it up. It was, the, I swear to God, one of the coolest toys ever made. He had this giant Shogun Warrior, and I had this record, and we were both on one bike, like a, a huffy street bike. One speed. We would, eat, we, we would eat, each take turns, you know, one would go in front and pedal the two of us for a couple of miles and we would switch and, you know, we got home and to the mall that way with our precious cargo. That's what we had to do with our lawn mowing money <laughs> if we wanted to get something cool when school was out. And that's one reason why I'm never going to part with this record because that's a fond memory. Oh, my goodness. A toast to doing extremely dangerous things with your younger brother on a bicycle when you're too young to know any better. Ah, yes, we both live to tell the tale. So my goodness, we're finally getting out of the Rolling Stones section, and we go right from Rolling Stones to Rollins. Now, I've talked about Tent talks. Uh, I've talked about Black Flag 
and SST on 10 Talks Tunes. Early Rollins Band. This stuff is killer. Killer. Rollins Band for the first few years of their existence with uh, Sugar Sim Kane and uh, Andrew Weiss and um, uh, the drummer's name. I forget the drummer's name. Who was the drummer? No, uh, yeah, Sim Kane was the drummer, Andrew Weiss and Chris Haskett on guitar. Yes, Haskett, Weiss, and Kane. The original Rollins Band. And notice this says Henry Rollins. It was the Rollins Band, but they hadn't been named the Rollins Band yet. This is a split album they did that only came out in Holland with a really cool Dutch band called Gore. They were all instrumental. Gore were pretty badass in their own right. But this set from 1987 by the Rollins Band will blister the paint off your living room wall. It'll set fire. Your, the paneling on your living room wall will spontaneously ignite. The floorboards will come peeling off of the floor. Rollins Band, Holland, 1987, with a really good set by Gore on the B-side. I remember getting these in my original record store, Trash American Style, when we were still in Brookfield. I got a few of these from my importer, kept one for myself, sold the others. This is the one I kept, 1987, maybe 88 by the time it came out. Part of the core collection. I would hope this is on YouTube somewhere. I would also hope that maybe some of the other 87, 88 live shows by the Rollins Band are out there. There's one from London that's red hot. Oh, man, that stuff was dangerous. Dangerous. Rollins was like a man trying to turn himself inside out using a microphone. They had the band to back him up. Woo, good stuff. That's in bin number 17 of my personal collection. What do we got here? And this is the kind of thing that I like an awful lot. Um, I was a late convert to uh, Van Halen. I never, ever cared for David Lee Roth's solo stuff. But as we know, I do like bizarre, weird pressing. So here is a Spanish language pressing of David Lee Roth's first album. He sings all the songs in Spanish. The name is called Sonrisa Salvaje, which loosely translates into Savage Smile. He also did a Spanish-language version of his first EP, Crazy from the Heat. Haven't found that one yet. I'm a sucker for these kinds of things. There are Spanish-language records by John... Or even, I should just say, foreign-language records by everybody from Johnny Cash to ABBA to Joe Jackson to uh, David Bowie. I could go on and on and on and on. When I had my radio show, I would do entire sets of people like, you know, the Carpenter singing in a foreign language, the Captain and Tennille. Um, Peter Gabriel did an entire album in German. Love that kind of stuff. It's esoteric to the max. So that's why this one David Lee Roth album is in my collection. Sonrisa Salvaje, Savage Smile. Also known as Eat Him and Weep in the States. What else we got in the uh, R.O. section? Well, if you guys want to know about a really bizarre weirdo outsider artist, I definitely recommend Root Boy Slim and the Sex Change Band from Maryland. I believe they're from the Silver Spring area. Uh, if, I recall, if I recall my lore correctly, at some point Root Boy ended up outside of the local 7-Eleven with a uh, folding card table full of his records, trying to sell his records outside the 7-Eleven. Um, Ray Brennan. Ray, if you're on here and you're watching, can you corroborate that? I seem to recall you might have run into old Root Boy after he lost his major label contract and after he got drunk by IRS. Because even in the late 70s, old Root Boy was a little bit too weird for the general public. But Root Boy Slim and the Sex Change Band featuring the Root Tets. Love it. Featuring the a timeless classic called I Lost My Wig. And another one called Mood Ring. And according to Nate, Root Boy Slim still owes Nate money. Why am I not surprised? Nate, if you would like to elaborate and post a comment, please do. I'll bet Root Boy checked out owing a lot of people a lot of money. There used to be a record store in, um, I think, Bethesda, Maryland, called um, 
Joe's record Paradise, and Joe was in possession of all of Root Boy's master tapes and stuff like that. I wonder whatever happened to all those master tapes. Nate, you might want to look out for Joe's record Paradise. Maybe you can strike a deal. Get some of your unpaid money back in the, the tombs of ma into, into the tune of master tapes. You can release a Root Boy Slim record if you want. If you think you can even make your money back on that, I kind of doubt it, but you know, maybe. What else is worth talking about here? And they all are. Oh, here's one of my absolute favorites. This is we're still in the RO section. This is this falls under the category of stuff that you cannot make up. I found this record. I found a 45 by this guy, and I picked it up because it had the exact same legend on the 45 as it does on the album. How are you going to pass up an album? It says so right there on the front. The world's greatest singer, Ruvon, wearing his uh, somewhat ill-fitting leather suit and his greasy pompadour. And look, there he is on the back, riding a motorcycle. The 45 also had a picture of him riding a motorcycle, but a different motorcycle on a different street. So, all right, there he is. He's a leather guy. He rides a motorcycle. He's the world's greatest singer. His angle was that he would sing the pop standards of the day, but in a, an incredible sotto voce opera voice. And like, what does he do on this one? The shadow of your smile, what now my love, give me love. Uh, you know, so you think of the shadow of your smile, right? Everybody knows that old standard. You ain't heard nothing till you've heard Ruvon bust out those operatic pipes and do What Now My Love or The Shadow of Your Smile. Incredible. To make the very long story of Ruvon short, it got a little bit longer because I discovered that, you know, his later stuff was independently released, but for a while, he was on RCA. And he did several albums on RCA, which I've been able to track down over the years. Long story short, the name Ruvon came to him through numerology and he sang himself to death. He sang himself to death. I'm just going to leave it at that. The internet research team, you can check out the story of Ruvon. I, don't, I can't make this stuff up. I, I only collect the records. I don't make anything up sang himself to death. And listening to some of these records, I believe it. What else we got? Here's a really cool one that, uh, you know, to go back to the days when I had my radio show, I would do sets by the backing bands, like Elvis Costello and the Attractions. Well, the Attractions put out an album. Gary Newman's backing band put out an album under the name of Dramatis. And The Rumor, who were Graham Parker's backing band, put out a bunch of records and I think they're all better than the records that they did with Graham Parker. This is a really good one. Uh, Clogs and Krauts, Frogs and Sprouts. Great record. You should be able to find it in a cheap bin near you. I find it in bin number 17 of my personal collection. Nate wants to know if I have any Merrill Womack. I do not have any Merrill Womack. My good friend Michael Pilmer from Raleigh, North Carolina, has got a, a stack like this of Merrill Womack records. And I, I have not found one ever in the wild. I know they're out there, but yeah, Merrill Womack. Whew. How about this? This is a prized possession. The Rutland Times, featuring Eric Idle and Neil Innes, autographed by Neil Innes. That's a happy thing to have in the collection. The Rutland Times, of course, was the precursor to the Ruttles, the Prefab Four, the band who, in my opinion, are definitely better, bigger, more fabulous than the Beatles. Rutland Times, the Ruttles. That's how Mr. Tent rolls, baby. Rut and roll, rut and roll. Yeah, let's see, then we get to the uh, the aforementioned saccharine trust divider. 
as addressed on the archived episode about SST records. All right, we're getting into the S section. We might actually get through the bin. Ah, here's a cherished possession. I talked about this once before in my original... Speaking of original records from the collection, the St. Vitus promo album from 1985 that I got when I was working at Open Books and Records in North Miami Beach. Here's a heretical statement. I hereby postulate that the Saints' second album is better than the Saints' first album. I just said it. I think Eternally Yours is better than I'm Stranded. Better. Better. This record rocks. Once upon a time, I found... I forget how many. I think half a dozen sealed copies of this record at a junk shop in the middle of Kansas for a dime each. Ten cents a pop for sealed copies of the Saints, Eternally Yours. And it, and those records were there with some sealed South Florida punk records. They had records by The Drills and Amazing Grace for ten cents each, sealed in the middle of, I ain't kidding, kids, absolutely nowhere in Kansas. So I spent the $1.25 or whatever and got a nice little stack of sealed punk rock records. If I, remember, if I remember correctly, at the time, I got $10 each for the sealed Saints records. Spend a dime and make 10 bucks? Not bad. Probably should have kept a couple of them just for the future, but, you know, when you're young in punk rock, there is no future. What other SA records do I want to talk about? Mm, Sky Saxon. Jeff Clayton talked about Sky Saxon a lot on his break on through yesterday. How about Telly Savalas? Another favorite subgenre of mine. Celebrities who absolutely do not know how to sing, yet go ahead and sing anyway. And in Telly's case, I, I got four. Plus, I think one more on CD, and I think he's got more than that. I think Telly put out probably 10 or 12 albums at some point. The dude can't sing. He can't sing for Jack. He just kept cranking out records. I will someday own them all. Telly Savalas. Let's see. I know we're kind of running out of time here, so I'm just going to get through here. We're almost there. Almost at the end of crate number 17. I should say bin numbers. Lots of Sky Saxon. This one's great. I love New York's Harvest. This has got a great song about New York cheese on it. And I don't mean culture. I mean pasteurized dairy product. An entire album of extremely innocuous songs about New York uh, farm products. Yes, track five, side one. I love New York State cheese. This cheese is sure to please. And then let's see what else have we got here in bin number 17. Oh, here's another one that I've owned for a very long time. Since practically the day it came out. First Scratch Acid album. Man, this album's incredible. Pre-Jesus Lizard, in case you people keep track of these things. I think I like Scratch... I think I like Scratch Acid better than Jesus Lizard. Great album. I ain't parting with this one. Uh, let's see here. Ah, one of those gray area pressings. Screamers. If you don't know about the Screamers, you better find out. Screamers. Strength through intimidation. OMFG. Uh, let's see here. I don't feel like talking about that. Don't feel like talking about that. I don't feel like talking about that. I don't feel like talking about that. I will mention criminally underrated 70s British rock band, the sensational Alex Harvey band. Not everything they did was a 10 out of 10 winner, but the ones that are really are. This is some tasty stuff here, kids. Ah, uh, the sensational Alex Harvey band. And the last record in the SE section is one that I'm very fond of. It is indirectly a TPOS product. 
It is the only vinyl pressing ever of TPOS number 31. 76% uncertain. Where's the lid? My old friend Burkhard Yarish, who used to have a great hardcore discography book called Flex, in which he attempted to document every single pressing of every single United States punk slash hardcore record in his book. In fact, do I have it here? Yeah, check this out. On my reference bookshelf here in my office, I'm going to reach over and show you guys a real artifact. The Flex U.S. Hardcore Discography book. This is volume two. Look at the size of this thing, man. It's like a phone book. If any of you people out there remember what a phone book is, you tried to document them all. This is like, you know, pre-internet. So this was an invaluable resource. It still is. You know, if you don't feel like doing hours of tedious internet research, you can just do the old-fashioned thing and take the book and open it up to the appropriate letter. Hey, look at that. Look what I just randomly opened the book to. How cool is that? Henry Rollins' Gore, a live album. Synchronicity is alive and well here on Temp Talks Tunes. It's all here, kids, at least up to the uh, whatever day in 1990-something he printed it. So Burkhardt is still out there. He's got a, a Facebook page, of course, maybe even a website. And he and I did this cooperative venture where I had released this on cassette, and Burkhardt did a vinyl pressing that only came out in Germany. And boy, look at the, uh, look at the layout on that. I did that layout with uh, actual stickers, glue, and scissors. I'm sure I could do better now. But at the time, that was some pretty hot shiznit. And um, nice green vinyl, too. Technically, it's TPOS in conjunction with Flex. That might be your last bit of homework, kids. If y'all don't know, 76% uncertain from Connecticut. And you like very well-written, very intelligent punk slash hardcore. 76% uncertain is your band. One of the best that Connecticut ever produced. And I'm very happy and proud to have been a part of this release. And that, my friends, didn't sneeze. Thought I was gonna, but I didn't. That, my friends, wraps up this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. I want to thank you all for tuning in, as always. It is my pleasure to yip, yap, rap, and wax rhapsodic about music and the physical media which delivers the music. It's the best of all possible worlds as far as I'm concerned. And I thank you guys for taking the time out of your busy schedules to smell what I'm cooking, to dig what I'm burying, and to just enjoy yourselves. So yeah, keep an eye on my YouTube channel. Keep an eye on my Bandcamp and Discogs. I'm trying to get get away from eBay. eBay takes too much of a chunk these days. I mean, you know, I know I know a lot of people like eBay, but as a seller, I don't like them nearly as much as I like Discogs and or Bandcamp. So check it out. Check me out. Check out the almighty anti scene, and you will find yourselves entertained, educated, illuminated, and just generally better off than you might be right now. So I expect to be back in about 167 hours' time. Until we meet again, this is indeed Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State.